February 3, 2019, The Origins and History of the Jewish Catskills. Our honorary grand chair of this entire festival is Elaine Grossinger Edis. Yes. And Elaine is here, and she's going to... And I have to tell you that without Elaine Grossinger, none of this was going to happen. She introduced us to so many people. She loaned us so much of her own personal memorabilia. She has been the energy and the force behind this whole thing. And we love Elaine. The best part for me, this has all been so much fun. This is such a reunion for so many people. But the best part for me has been getting to know Elaine. <laughs> Robin Cabot and Karen Lazar are the co-chairs. They have done so much to make this happen. They worked so hard, and this beautiful reception was all their planning. All the perfect choice of noshes was their doing, and I know you enjoyed it. Anne Schwartz, memorabilia curator, and of course, as I said, Terry Burns, exhibition curator. And then there's a whole committee, and it's listed in here. I'm not going to mention it, but every one of you made this possible. So now I'm going to introduce you to Terry Burns, because we're not done with the introductions yet, and then we'll go from there. Terry, where are you? Thanks, Steph. I think I could take my entire sheet and throw it away, because... <laughs> Almost everything you said is on my, on my little crib sheet here. Well, welcome, all. And uh, I won't tell you my name again or what my title is because Stephanie did a great job of that. But I, I am thrilled that you're all, all here. And in the words of the late, great Tumblr, Lou Goldstein, Simon says, give yourself an applause for being here on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, Elaine... I, I have to also thank you. You're a national treasure and an extraordinary woman and with boundless energy that I admire and wish I had. Uh, I want to thank you for sharing every, all your incredible stories and your insight and your wisdom. It's really been a high point of my time here. Thank you. And, and of course, I was going to thank what I call my Wonder Women, who really, really all... We went through, I need you to all to know, we, Stephanie told you hundreds? No, it's in the thousands. We went through almost between 13 to 1400 items, memorabilia, photograph, tchotchkes, matchbooks, you name it, that came in to us. And all of them with great love and, and affection from those who contributed. And they contributed from the Tri-County area, from Miami, Palm, Palm Beach, Fort Lauderdale, and all the way up into New York and the Catskills. And that's, you know, my special thank to, thanks also to Alan Frischman. But Lori, Rob, and Donna, Karen, Sue, Cheryl, I mean, these women spent so much time, and I would get these little epiphanies in the middle of the night, and I'd send them text messages. Oh, we're going we're gonna to paint the backgrounds of all the frames to make them look like we're scrapbooking, or like, I don't know if you all noticed, but those frames are all hand-painted underneath to look like flocked old flocked paper or scrapbooking paper. And I had these amazing women that would just go, okay, okay, Terry, whatever you say, we're here. And they were here. And without them, we wouldn't have had this. We did this in four weeks. We put this exhibition together. So I just, I can't thank them enough. And I'm, I appreciate you allowing me to do it again. So um, curating this exhibition has been about the remarkable history of the Jewish Catskills. It was really a crash course for me because I'm a, I'm a nice Jewish girl from North Miami Beach, Florida. So I grew up with nothing but Jewish friends and neighbors, but I didn't know anything about the Catskills. I mean, I'm from Florida. We certainly didn't go to Catskills to, to uh, vacation. So it's really been a crash course and a wonderful one at that. And all the stories and all, all the wonderful memorabilia and, that I, and all of the just incredibly touching uh, memories that I've heard from all of you and people that have come in and they're so excited and they, they, they literally touch the frames, which I don't understand. It's a museum you don't touch, but they're touching the frames and, and having these memories and finding things out. And I had a wonderful woman who's here today and I don't know where you she is, but she literally came up and gave me a hug. There she is. And gave me a hug. And that was just extraordinary for someone who's who's a curator who's working on something like this, and uh, that's it, of history. You want to make sure you touch people and that you're telling a story. And obviously, I was successful, and I couldn't have done it without all of you. So I thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn the mic over to um, Elaine, and she's going to uh, introduce our guest speaker. So thanks again. Good evening. It's so good to see so many of you here. 
And I would just like to take a moment before I do what I'm supposed to do to thank all of you for coming. Your interest in what is and will always be the wonderful Catskills and for the JCC for honoring the area the way you have. So thank you and I hope I'll have a chance to chat with you and see you during this month. Professor Phil Brown studies the Jewish experience in the Catskill Mountains. He is founder and president of the Catskill Institute, an organization that works to record and remember the history of the Catskills through conferences, public speaking, supports scholarly, scholarly research, collecting materials for the world's largest archive of Catskill items, and running a large website. For 13 years in a row, he ran an annual History of the Catskills Conference. Most recently, he has focused on the experience of the Holocaust, an immediate period after the Catskills. His book, his books are Catskills Culture, a Mountain Rat's Memoir of the Great Jewish Resort Area, In the Catskills, A Century of the Jewish Experience in the Mountains as Editor, and Summer Haven, The Catskills, The Holocaust, and the Literary Imagination with co-author Holly Levitsky. Phil Brown is University Distinguished Professor of Sociology and Health Sciences at Northeastern University where he directs the Social Science Environmental Health Research Institute and is on the executive committee of the Jewish Studies Program. Phil plays the piano in the Klezmer Band, Two Klez for Comfort. <laughs> Without any further ado, Dr. Phil Brown. Ah, guten Abend. In dem Herzen von jedem die Catskills eine süße Teil von unserer Sikorn und unserer Geschichte. In die Catskills wir haben gehabt eine Kehre, wir haben gehabt Glück und Freiheit. Heute wir kommen in einem als die Jungen sollten leben in unser Herzen und in Schamen. Oh, oh, you didn't say what's going to be in Yiddish. <laughs> so it's all right, I'll translate. Okay. Uh, it really, because it was so important that way, we have to start with, with that. Uh, and what that means, for those of you who don't know, the Mamalash and in the hearts of the Jews, the Catskills is a sweet part of our memory and history. In the Catskills, we had a community, we had happiness and freedom. Today, we come together so those years can live together in our hearts and souls. And that's what it is. Uh, that's why we're here on Super Bowl Sunday, because we didn't play football, we played handball. <laughs> and we also played basketball. That was once a very Jewish sport. And mahjong, which definitely will, will be an Olympic uh, sport soon, of course. So I grew up in the Catskills. My life is there. I've spent many, many years uh, doing things like this, helping to bring people together around these memories. And it's always a joy. Uh, it's a joy to see how much people love this. It's a joy to see what kinds of things people have kept over the years. And after my mother died, uh, some 20 years after my father, back in 93, I was an orphan. And as I was writing a eulogy for her funeral, I realized uh, the things I was thinking of were my life in the Catskills. And that this was my heritage that I couldn't talk about her, I couldn't talk about my father without the fact that they, we, we were all mountain rats. We, we were there, and yeah, we were in North Miami Beach also in the winter time, like many other people who went back and forth. And we were drawn as mountain rats back. We would like take our roots and just uproot ourselves to go back to the mountains. And you know, indeed, uh, where I lived um, in North Miami Beach, uh, not my neighborhood exactly, but the neighborhood where my shul, Beth Torah, was, was called Monticello Park because it was founded by people in Monticello. And, and this is all true. I mean, I, I once I met a student there. His name was Mark Zalkin. My first thing was not, hello, how are you? He said, oh, Zalkin's El Dorado. We got a new gym teacher, Miss Zeiger. I said, I'm sorry, Zalkin's Birchwood Lodge. 
uh, we got a new gym teacher, Ms. Iger. I said, Ms. Iger, your family had the El Dorado. So this was what people knew, you know, in, in North Miami Beach in those days. We were all veterans in one way or another. So I needed to record this, and I needed to, uh, to write down the things that I knew and the memories of many other people. And so that was the origin of this first book, Catskill Culture. Uh, a hundred uh, more interviews with people, uh, my own memories, and lots of research trips back to the Catskills. I, I had been away there from there for a while. Um, and as you heard, I, I began not just with that, but then soon I realized that lots of wonderful people who, who've written about the Catskills, including Eileen Pollack, our speaker tomorrow, um, whose novel, Paradise New York, um, loosely situated in the family hotel, um, is just an exquisite and funny book that if you haven't read, it's like the quintessential experience of the Catskills. I, I, I urge you to read that. Um, but her excerpt from there and from anyone else who wrote about the Catskills uh, is, is in this collection. And then more recently, uh, I had the occasion, and I'll talk about this uh, a bit more on Tuesday because of helping to work uh, on the advisory board for the film that I hope you'll see, The Four Seasons Lodge. Um, I was very interested in the Catskills Holocaust experience. The very first man that I inter interviewed for my Catskill culture book was a guy who, he got off the boat right after the war, and Hyas met him and said, I have a job for you. We've got a job for you in the Catskills. They took him to the Flagler, and he got a job there as a steward. Uh, and why such a good job for somebody who was like a, a greener right off the boat? Um, because they looked at him, uh, and he started to talk to them in English, and they said, you speak English? He says, Favos <laughs> nicht. Uh, and and the, the, the combination of that being my first interview and also the fact of, of the Four Seasons Lodge where I got to meet my colleague, Hai Levitsky, uh, running a Jewish studies program at a Catholic school, Loyola Marymount, which appreciates what she does. So we put together Summer Haven, uh, and what we have in here are the people who wrote about the Catskills in the Holocaust and right afterwards. And it's, it's not just with the excerpts we have, but those of them who were living, which was most of them, got to revive, re relive this and to reflect on that experience. And if they had passed away, um, their wives, their husbands, their friends or relatives wrote something. And we did original research. We had a, a wonderful writing contest, one for original fiction, one for original nonfiction. And we had all the great experts in each field uh, on the committee to, uh, to make a decision and they won a cash prize. So this, this was uh, my third book, and I'll tell you later about what the next book might be. But it was very important for me to uh, not just write about this, but to meet people who were also interested, like me, in putting together something. And there was a conference that was held that it was at Sunny Oaks Lodge in Woodridge, right down the road from the Avon Lodge, where, where, where uh, many of the, uh, the, the famous uh, performers, uh, Sid Caesar in particular, um, had his start as the Tumler. Um, and we, we had a conference, and it was like we thought maybe we'll get a few people to come. We had no funding. We announced it a month ahead of time. Maybe 50, 60 people came at this very small hotel, Sunny Oaks. Lodge, which looked to the outside world like a bungalow colony, not a hotel. And uh, Helen Kutcher came there because her, her son-in-law was a, a great collector of postcards, and he did a talk on his collection. And she looks at me and says, why are you having a thing like this in such a schlock house? You should come to me. So it took three or four years of being at this little schlock house, and then we finally did go to Kutcher's for, for the last nine years or so of the conference. Uh, but, you know, talk about hotel owners trying to get the uh, competition, you know, away. Uh, but it was, it was all in, in good spirits. Mark Kutcher, as you know, is going to be on the program here uh, as part of the, showing the film uh, that's, that was made. They were filming that when we had our conference, the, uh, the 100th anniversary of the hotel. I mean, 100 years. And uh, Helen, of course, was a, a guest speaker for, for the Catskills Institute conference. So we began to say, look, this is going to live more than just one conference. We're going to have an institute. We're going to collect materials. And so we did this. And I, and I, I built this uh, with, with colleagues up from scratch. And it became uh, a lifelong obsession. And I think any of the, those of you who uh, have seen what it's like to start collecting this material, Alan Frischman is a good example. Um, other people I know, it becomes a, a habit that you can't break. because. 
Uh, it's fun, it's beautiful, you, you relive experiences, you, you help other people relive experiences, who contact people like myself all the time and say, can you help me find a piece of inf information? Uh, my father's 90th birthday is coming up. He, he, he used to stay at this hotel. The owner would read him bedtime stories. I would love to give him something. And, and I could send postcards and, and things from, from the hotel to this guy to give for his father for the 90th birthday party. And that was like one thing of many. So doing this work for me has been, you know, I think part of my uh, Jewish uh, experience. You know, this is doing a kind of series of mitzvot for, for people who, who want to use this and relive it. Um, so we did the conference for 13 years. Uh, it, it had its bar mitzvah and then it was finished. Uh, like lots of other children, unfortunately. But it was a grand, a grand experience. There's Helen Kutcher at, at one of the conferences. Um, there's the programs. We have this material on our website. Um, we had wonderful displays. Anybody who ever wrote about the Catskills spoke there. Uh, anybody who um, was a, a well-known uh, hotel owner, we had many of them speak. So what does it mean to, oh, and the other thing is, uh, it wasn't enough to do all this, but I also had to teach a course on the Catskills. So when I was still teaching at Brown University, I taught a course on the history of the Catskills. And then I, uh, I taught twice at Klez Camp, which is the, uh, the very renowned, uh, not just musical, but Yiddish culture overall event um, that was held for, for many years uh, in the Catskills and then moved to other places. Uh, but uh, I, I did that work and I, I actually wrote also a song about the Catskills, too. And, and that song, the sheet music and the words are in, in, in my book, that collection. So what does it mean to be a mountain rat? I grew up in a, a family of mountain rats. We were people who were, were pulled away uh, from businesses, from friends. We couldn't stay in Florida for the rest of the year. We had to go up there. And my parents began in 1946 as owners of a, a very small hotel. Brown's Hotel Royal. And everyone says, oh, Brown's. Said, no, no, Brown's Hotel Royal. Very small place. And you'll see pictures of it. So it was on White Lake. They were such bad business people, they only managed to keep it for six years. And we'll talk more about that. But they worked for other people after that all their lives. My mother was a chef, and this is her working in the Seven Gables Hotel in Greenfield Park. And she was very, very proud of her work. She was an independent woman. She understood what it was to be a feminist before people were using that word. Uh, this is her years later uh, working at Chait's in Accord. And when she died, I found in her purse uh, clippings from the New York Post, which was once a real newspaper. It was the entertainment paper. <laughs> and these, you know, circled here, you see uh, mention of her cooking at the Seven Gables, and here was a second clipping, not circle, but with the arrow. She was totally proud of the work. She went so out of her way uh, in the small hotels that she worked at, because a big hotel would not hire a woman chef, because they said, the men will not work under a woman. And so for all, all of her life, and mine as a result, we mainly worked uh, at small places. And she was, of course, um, Hard working. This was a job you have no idea. Uh, anybody who worked in the mountains worked very hard. Uh, I will show you a picture later of Carrie Camito, um, who was moving beds in her 90s. Um, if you if you managed to uh, survive in the Catskills, you had to be healthy to work the kind of crazy hours that people like Elaine worked and anybody else who owned a hotel worked. It was really hard work, and it never stopped. My father was variously a maitre d', look at him in this beautiful shiny shark skin suit. Um, for more years though, he was a driver for Harold's uh, dependable employment agency in Monticello. And he was the guy who drove people to their jobs. Uh, at one point early on before that, um, he apparently tried to start a small hotel somewhere in the Upper Catskills. No one knows much about it, uh, except like all his other businesses, it failed. Uh, my parents wound up in Fort Pierce, very crazy, like what are they doing there? Uh, and we, we're talking about in the early 50s, okay? Um, they thought that there, all these Jews are gonna start to drive down from New York to Miami Beach. They need to eat on the way. So, you know, here finally they're, you know, 
six hours away from the promised land and they can you know, get a good New York Jewish meal. Um, it, it did not work very well. In fact, I, I, spent, uh, I spent time today with my wonderful cousin who tells me about her father, my, my father's brother. The family would drive up there from uh, Hollywood to bring them food because they sometimes couldn't afford to buy food for the kitchen. So this failed, and they, they thought, let's try something again. And the next r revival of this was Brown's Jewish Restaurant. OK, there's like eight Jewish families in the town. <laughs> so it's like a, a clan town par excellence. What were they thinking? This was why they were not good business people. Uh, the, the Kutcher family uh, had a partial uh, interest in, at some point in the Haddon Hall, and so this was one of their gigs here uh, in the winter. They ran the coffee shop at the Haddon Hall uh, on, on uh, Miami Beach. And otherwise, you know, trying to make this hotel work, um, this is, you know, I just told you how hard it was to work. So how was my father sitting in a chair, smiling? Hotel owners didn't do that. They smiled when they were with their guests, playing cards at night after everything, when they were uh, greeting them in the dining room. But did they ever sit by themselves and have a spare second? I have no idea how this happened um, and how he had time to play with me in front of the volleyball net or how he could hold me in front of this, the proverbial canna garden. This was the small hotel's tropical paradise. You know, you took a bunch of white stones, stones, painted them white, made a circle, and you planted these tall cannas. He was so proud to, uh, to have this time with me uh, and, and to run his small little hotel. I never had pictures of it. And again, when my mother died, I had surprises. And the surprise was that she had in her possession this postcard. And I have actually scoured for many, many years on eBay and other places. No one else has ever had a copy of this for sale. Uh, and there's, there's a big market in these Landers postcards, which we'll, we'll talk about in some detail. But um, the point is that um, I said to myself, I got to find this hotel because they never talked about it except to say the hotel's gone. And there were many years that we were very close to the hotel. And my father would drive sometimes with me in the car to get bagels in Monticello to bring back to the coffee shop he was running. And we would you know, drive down um, 55 to 17 uh, to go into Monticello. And all we had to do was turn right you know, for a little bit on 17, and we would have been at the hotel. It was just like a couple of hundred feet away from the, that intersection. And he never wanted to do it because he was embarrassed that he had lost his hotel. One year, um, my parents didn't have jobs lined up. We were staying with George Shapiro and Miriam Shapiro. Their friends uh, had a bungalow colony in Kanyanga. We could have walked a couple of hundred yards, you know, and we could have been there. And they never said, let's go visit. And so I said to myself, I'm going to memorize the, the card here. I'm going to look at the angles and what the building would look like. I know a hotel like this could never have existed uh, still into the 90s. It would have crumbled and fallen down. And, but I know what the foundation will look like. I have a general idea where it is. I will find it. And uh, I did. I actually found that it. it was there. Um, but before I show you what it looked like today, I just want you to see the close-up of, of what the classic little hotel looked like, uh, this wonderful uh, mission-style architecture with the, the front walkway and the stairway in the center. And we'll visit that because it's got a very deep significance. This is what I found. I was shocked out of my mind to see that this was running as the Bradstan Country Inn. It had been beautifully redone by uh, a couple of people who were in the entertainment uh, business in New York. They ran cabarets. And they, they, but they were singers and musicians themselves, and they had the best acts as well that would come up there. They, they had uh, framed pictures of the hotel at different stages of its existence. Uh, friends of theirs had made beautiful uh, ceramic pieces of art of what the hotel looked like from the old postcards and photos they had. And they had redone. Um, this was the inside, uh, and they made it look more Victorian. You know, it didn't look really like a Catskills hotel, um, but they were doing their own design, and this was what they came up with. Uh, and they turned every two rooms into one room, 
um, which was already pretty small, but if you ever stayed at a small hotel, you know, you know it had you know, a sink and the bathroom was down the hall. Uh, it was primitive. Um, they found in the attic a handwritten menu by my mother written in, in 1951. Uh, they showed this to me and gave it to me, and as soon as I looked at it, I recognized the way you do, you recognize your parents' handwriting instantly. Uh, and this was how uh, primitive the hotel was, that they wrote their own menus in script. They didn't have a mimeograph machine to print them. Um, Scott uh, and uh, his uh, uh, partner, Eddie, Eddie. Ed, Eddie uh, found rate cards, okay? And, they, uh, and of course, I would later find from my family uh, photos. This was my father's sister and her husband walking up the stairs from White Lake. Um, even though this was a very small hotel, you didn't get dressed up. Look how dressed up they are so that they can just be at the hotel. Um, and my cousins who would uh, come up, some worked, some stayed, um, and, and nobody knew who was working or staying, I think which is partly why they lost the hotel. Um, but uh, a, lot, a lot of them worked there. Um, my, my dear cousin Michelle, who's here now, was telling me stories uh, of this as well. Um, my, my dear recently departed sister, uh, uh, cousin, who was the, uh, the, the daughter of that couple that you saw walking up the stairs, look how well-dressed she is, just to walk down the stairs of the hotel. And you would think this was like something fancy out of a classic Hollywood movie, the way she's dressed, making a grand entrance down the staircase of what's really a very small, um, not-so-fancy hotel. Um, but again, that grand staircase was a place where, where a young woman like that could, could make her grand entrance and feel beautiful and proud and, and happy to be there. And I got to go back with my own family, with my wife, with uh, her mother, her aunt, and my kids. Uh, and I got to stay there, and I got to write an article uh, that's in that collection in the Catskills called Sleeping in My Parents' Catskills Hotel. Um, as I said, they did not do very well. Um, they bought the hotel in 46, and they went bankrupt in uh, 1952. And I was able to find uh, this material in, in the records office, the, the, the town and the county offices in Monticello. So very sad, but then it, you know, it led them to work in other places um, for the rest of their lives. Uh, I learned the hotel business, though, not there because I was too young, because um, I was three years old when they lost it. We moved to Florida. We, we didn't get back to the Catskills until these folks from Jackson Heights, the perver ver proverbial people driving down on their way to Miami Beach, said, mm, this is good food. You should come cook in the Catskills. We're opening a hotel there. And the Port Noise and the Rings were opening up uh, the Seven Gables Hotel in Greenfield Park. And there you see a postcard of it. Um, this was a very early postcard back uh, you know, in, in the 20s or, or, or 30s, you know, judging by the car there. Um, and this was the Landis card. So a a Alfred Landis was the, the same guy who did my parents' hotel card, the, the magnificent artist of this. Um, the most important thing to notice here is the building in the bottom uh, center. Um, and that building did not exist. And the reason it didn't exist is because the owners would say to Landis, if we have a good season, we're going to put up a new building. <laughs> we want the customers to think the hotel is always expanding to keep up with everybody else. So you should add a building. And Landis would do this. Landis would, would look at these, he would sometimes photograph them, and then he would go back to his studio in Wurtsboro, and what he would do would be to make believe he was an aerial uh, in a plane. He would do these aerial views and gave himself great poetic license to actually write uh, on top of buildings, things like casino, day camp, et cetera. Um, uh, and at one of the events like this, okay, somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, I have a photo for you. Do you recognize this? I said, it's the main house at the Seven Gables. Didn't miss a beat. It was just so uniquely uh, evident. Um, and this is my mother and, and a relative of ours. She's taking um, maybe an hour off between lunch and dinner. Um, she loves to plant gardens, so she's actually planting gardens on her time off, uh, even though she's working like a beast. Uh, and that's in front of the, the casino. 
And there's my father, who um, for a number of years ran the coffee shop in this casino. And that was where I learned how, how to make egg creams, how to do fried egg sandwiches, how to uh, work in the kitchen to help to sell beer and soda in the kitchen at the tender age of like 11 or 12, so not very legal. Um, but learned all the tricks of the trade from sitting in the kitchen and watching my mother. My father would come home when he wasn't running the, the concession and when he was working at Dependable. He would come home after a long day and he would you know, say hello to me, give me a kiss, maybe throw a, a ball with me for a few minutes, and then he would put on an apron and go help her uh, on the main line. Um, my, uh, again, people you know, would come up and give me these photos uh, of the Seven Gables at, at these events. Uh, and that's me in front of the casino. Um, I was very, uh, very tickled with you know, being able to work there. Um, I had fantasies of being a musician one day. I, I became one of sorts. Here's me fielding around on the drums on the stage there. Uh, not that I ever really learned to play the drums. Going back years later, when I was doing the research, all that was left were two buildings. And this was what was called the bungalow. Uh, and in the, the background was the day camp. Now, it wasn't a bungalow in the sense that anyone rented it. It was just a small building with six rooms, but they called it the bungalow. And that was all that was left. Um, a little bit later, when I started to, to work full time, uh, at, this is at the Commodore, uh, fancying myself again, you know, on, on stage one way or another. Um, this was a place, again, where my father had a coffee shop. And I, I realized as I looked at these photos how meaningful this whole place was for me and my family, but for millions of Jews who stayed there, who worked there, who did everything that made this such a, a place. It was not just for metropolitan New York, and not just from people with money, but every social class could go there. People came from all over, from Philadelphia, from New York, from, uh, from Maryland, from Boston. And indeed, when I, I put an ad in, in the Jewish newspaper in Boston to get interviewees, um, the, the people at the paper said, nobody from Boston you know, went to the Catskills. I said, take the ad anyway. It's not going to cost me much. You, know, you could use the revenue. I got so many people, including a guy, Bernie Garber, who ran a travel agency, and he sold vacation trips to the Catskills, and because there was no way to get to the Catskills, he started to run a car service there as well. So people did go there from all over. And if you had money or didn't have money, there was always a place to go. And in the 50s and 60s, in the heyday, an estimated half a million people a year went and stayed in these hotels. They went to preserve a cultural and a religious affiliation to escape the drudgery of the year's hard work and to find romance. And in the Catskills, they could have a proper vacation like any regular American, but with a Jewish milieu. The thing is that these were societies. They weren't just a hotel where you went to. They were familial. People knew a lot about each other. They created intimate relationships in different milieus. And I'll give you an example of what the, this looked like um, in terms of the Seven Gables. Uh, those of us who, who worked there uh, and people who came and stayed there and the owners thought of this as a Jackson Heights hotel because that's where the owners came from. Most of the staff did. They recruited from Jackson Heights. They had a person called the solicitor. And the solicitor's job was to round up patrons. And they got a small cut of the, the fee uh, of, of the rental. And they got to stay there for free the whole summer with their family. And these people sometimes would move from hotel to hotel. Sometimes owners whose hotels went out of business would then become solicitors elsewhere. But they would go to Hadassah. They would go to the women's club, to the men's club. They would go to every event they could think of. And they would tell people, do I have a vacation for you? This is such a Hamish place. And people from the neighborhood, you're going to know them. Uh, it's everyone from Jackson Heights. Ah, a few people from Astoria maybe, but mainly it's Hamish from Jackson Heights. And they treat you so well. And I will get you a discount because I know you from the women's club. And this, this was the kind of small business mentality that made it work there because everybody um, had a little bit of this. And these Jewish uh, residents from New York mainly, again, it was really mainly New York, created a resort land where they imported this music, this vaudeville review style, the culinary customs, the language, the worldview uh, of Jewish life. And, and there was never any resort area in the world like this. It was a place that, that people studied. This was how the cruise lines thought about the all-inclusive vacation. This was how the Caribbean resorts thought about it. 
but it wasn't always uh, very elegant. It wasn't always uh, as fancy as, as it would be in later years. Uh, and it wasn't easy to get there either because people didn't have cars, so they had to take the railroad. Um, and they took the O and W, the Ontario and Western, also known as the Old and Weary. <laughs> and um, they, they got off at the station and they were met there if they had a reservation by the owner who would drive them. Uh, if they didn't have a reservation, there would be other owners there saying, do I have a good bargain for you? You should come. Um, Mandel Wakefield, the historian of the Catskills, um, did a beautiful book, and he was also an artist, and he did this beautiful image of an O&W locomotive that's, a, that's become a, a very emblematic piece. And how they got up there also was um, by looking at what the O&W printed every year, Summer Homes of the Catskills. This was a very thick book, and you know, this was starting in the 20s, um, and it was glossy. It was a very expensive production, and they could do it because a lot of people would, would, would buy into it. Um, this was before everything was Jewish, and so um, you looked in the book, and if it said churches nearby, you knew that that meant no Jews allowed. In other words, uh, you know, if it was a Jewish hotel, it said dietary laws. It didn't even say kosher, dietary laws. That could just mean, like, I need salt-free. I mean, why couldn't they say kosher? Well, anyway, that was uh, the way that people found them. Um, and they took the railroad. Um, and so many Jews, of course, took the railroad that here the O&W actually printed brochures in Yiddish for people who didn't understand enough English to get up there. And the hotels, uh, there were several Yiddish language papers in New York at the time. And these were some of the ads of the hotels uh, that were very common. And you uh, later, if you had a little bit of, uh, of money, but you still didn't have your own car, you could take the hack. You could take Goldie's Mountain Line. You could take <laughs> other car services. And, and this was actually still on the side of a building somewhere in Queens about 30 years ago. And of course, you had to stop at the Red Apple, even though you had just left home. You know, you couldn't get all the way to the mountains. I mean, granted, the highway, the, uh, the freeway wasn't there. Um, it, it was a long drive. And um, as, as Freddie Roman often jokes about, the anti-Semitic cops would put up cones in the way uh, when you got to Goshen to, to keep the Jews from getting there. Uh, but you had to stop at the Red Apple, and you had to compare uh, notes uh, with other people. This was also where the entertainers went before and after their shows. Uh, it started small. It started not so graceful. Uh, it started out with, with farmers. Baron de Hirsch you know, thought, um, let's make the Jews Americanized. Um, and not just here in, in, in America, but in Argentina, too, and other places, in New Jersey. Uh, let's make them farmers, because they couldn't be farmers in most of the old country. So they came up there, and he, he bankrolled them. He formed the Jewish Agricultural Society to help them. And they began to take in borders. Um, and, and this is a family that was still into the 90s living on their farm. Um, and they no longer you know, were strong enough to work it, and they were leasing it out. But they were happy to come speak to our conference about what the years were like to, to be a farmer in the Catskills. And indeed, in this very specialized area of Catskills studies, um, there are books on every subject. Uh, and, and this is uh, Lavend uh, Abe Lavender and uh, Clarence Steinberg's wonderful book, Jewish Farmers of the Catskills. Uh, and you see the, in the centerpiece, Abdul Magan David, um, the, the shul that we'll, I'll show you a photograph of later, the um, Chorcholim. Uh, it started very modest. It started sometimes as Civil War era farmhouses where people took in borders um, because they realized you could make more money from borders than you could from chicken and eggs. Um, very, um, very um, small scale, the Waldorf house here. Um, and then the Kuchelein. So uh, the Kuchelein here, this is Lipkowitz's, it's still standing as part of a bungalow colony. Uh, you cook for yourself. You know, you, you get a room and you get the, the, the first burner on the left side of stove number two, and you get shelf three on, on, fr on icebox, not fridge, icebox number four. And you get a table in the, in the dining room and you, you cook for yourself. Uh, and that lady gave way, you know, to the bungalow colony. Uh, but some of them were still standing, you know, into the 50s, operating as kuchelines. Uh And there's another one of them as well. The entertainment was not grand in these places. There was no day camp. This was day camp. 
you know, you had seesaws, and when the seesaw was less interesting, um, you could draw on the table. And then for the, uh, the final culmination of the day's activities, you could sit on the farmer's tractor. <laughs> so nothing very fancy. And there were no pools in the small places. There was the Nevisink River, a beautiful river, and no, no doubt that was the reason so many hotels and colonies sprang up alongside the, the river, from Liberty all the way into uh, to Woodridge. Uh, and the more recent picture, a beautiful, famous trout stream. Uh, later pools did come into being. Bungo Colony would actually gather, in this case, all of the people to take a picture because it was such a big deal in this colony to have it. Um, Martin Boris, who's a, a person who wrote fiction about the Catskills, uh, came from a family uh, also in Glen Wild, uh, and, and this was their place. Um, these were very, very unique. These were some small stucco bungalows. Mostly they were uh, made of wood, but these were some small stucco ones that were still standing. Uh, in some cases, this was a Chandelier Lake. This was a place that was a, a singles-oriented place, uh, and young couples. Um, and if you look at that, you could see these don't even have full walls. They have kind of canvas um, for the upper part of the wall. So people were willing to put up with a very, very uh, laid-back atmosphere. And it was a very inexpensive thing here, you know, for $1,000 you have the entire summer. Um, and this is 1975, so this could be a, a wonderful place to go. I myself, I have to say as a hotel kid, tended to look down on the bungalow colonies, and, and, and I'm ashamed of it now for those of you who stayed there, you should forgive me. Um, uh, but one year my father, who couldn't get a gig elsewhere, uh, actually got a bungalow colony uh, coffee shop at what was called SGS in uh, Swan Lake, and um, this was what it later became when it was a, an Orthodox place, uh, Caymans. Uh, I mentioned before George and Miriam Shapiro, in their colony, of course, they, like other colony owners, had a small store where they sold you stuff, uh, and, and this was still standing when I was doing the research as well. This is amazing if you look at this, because here is a brochure from the Monticello Bungalow Association. We're talking about how big was this. Uh, our, our list on the website, you know, we have many, many hundreds of hotels and bungalow colonies that were existing still in the 50s and 60s. And the Monticello Bungalow Association, just for the one town, granted it was the biggest of the towns, had two offices on each side of town. They could staff that with people to rent bungalows for a small cut for the owner. Starting small, okay? Um, does anybody recognize this? Of course. So Selig and Malka, these uh, immigrants thought, oh, I have a farmhouse. This was the origin of everything that you know from Elaine and her family. Um, this was how it started, uh, very small. And that was the beauty of it, that people could start small and, and build up. Um, and th this was just so striking. This was the Waldmere, which was a grand old hotel when it was very small. Um, this was the Evans when it first started. This was the Roy when it first started. This was Kutcher's. Uh, the, uh, the Roy when it was Ratner's, okay? Uh, and this was Kutcher's when it first started. So things were very small. This was the Maple Court, uh, a very, very small farmhouse originally. Um, and then they did well renting out rooms to people and they built what they thought was a very large hotel. Um, and this was just, you know, right off uh, Route 52 uh, in Greenfield Park. And Alice Gutter, whose family this was for years, uh, would keep giving me these wonderful pieces of material. Place I worked at, the Carmel, it's interesting here because this style here, you see uh, this is the fake Tudor style. Um, and what you see is uh, something you know up until the early 60s. And then the competition is happening, all right? And people have to modernize. And so what they do is they put on a modern front and they go almost invariably bankrupt doing this. If you look all the way at the top, you still see the little you know, piece there of the old hotel. But now you've got a small uh, a front with you know, all kinds of modern windows and uh, pink plastic and an indoor pool, okay? Meanwhile, the clientele was getting pretty old at this point. They weren't using the outdoor pool. So who's going to use an indoor pool? The staff. We loved it. It was really, it was a lot of fun. We would sneak in there at night even if they, they locked it up. But the hotels in, in the competition later 
um, we're going bankrupt. Uh, and this is what it looked like um, years later, it became the stage door manor theater camp, a very, very esteemed place to train youngsters in the theater arts. Uh, people were very, very proud of, of their hotels. Um, and they put their names on their postcards. And this is very interesting here. Charles Brown was once a partner here in another hotel, not Charles and William Brown's, but in the Ambassador, because there were partnerships that would go back and forth almost year by year. Um, Fleischer and Morgan Stern, uh, in the Flagler, um, they had other hotels as well. Um, now, again, starting small, here's Brickman's. It's that same shape as my parents' hotel that we tend to call um, you know, California mission architecture. Um, it's just bigger. It's got those side rooms. It's got that center staircase. It's got the, the fan light windows. It's got that little decorative design on top. Um, this is what it looks like later from a real aerial view. And Rickman's had gotten so big that the staff quarters, when I worked there as a waiter, were more elegant than the rooms that people were still renting at the Seven Gables. And if you could fly the plane even higher up, you would see the Windsor and Gilberts. And the point I'm trying, and a big bungalow colony as well, whose name I forget, but the point is that you could drive forever in the Catskills, and you would never be far away from a hotel or a colony. That's how dense it was, and that's, that's the point of showing you this. It was an entire universe. And, and you know, wherever you went, you saw um, from above, um, you saw here's the Pines aerial, uh, Concord, uh, Laurel's aerial, uh, the Concord, uh, and, and Shawanga. We talked before about um, the, the O&W brochure, you know, with the anti-Semitism in those uh, churches nearby. Uh, the Shawanga uh, was originally uh, a Gentile place. And it actually had in their brochure um, no Hebrews allowed. And when Jews bought it, they, they used the same brochure. They just had the printer kind of take uh, on the hot type, just get rid of that line. Um, but there were a lot of medium-sized hotels, too. And this was sort of more of the places I gravitated to, the small and the large ones, like, like the Greenwood Inn. Um, but uh, one, one of the things you should notice here um, is that these are, are very similar in style, the design. Um, they differ a little bit, but they, they again, those side rooms, the center, um, the, the top decorations. And um, they were proud to have their names on there, okay? And they often were amalgamations of the owners. Here's the Danby Lodge in Ferndale. Here's the Canco Inn, Canco, Cantor and Cone, Canco. Um, the proprietors were so happy um, that they would have their names on it, on the postcard. Um, here's the Peckler, which doesn't, I don't think, have a name on it. Um, the, but here's the Park Manor. Um, whether or not they really had the name written on there, the postcard says Abe Gutman Proprietor. People were just that proud that this was their hotel. So as I mentioned, there were these wonderful cards, uh, Alfred Landis. This is um, a beautiful place. This is the Overlook Hotel in Ferndale. Um, there were multiple hotels with similar names. If you went to a different town, you could have the same name. So uh, unlike... Um, uh, sometimes you just, you know, you could do that. So it, it would confuse people. Um, here's the embassy in South Fallsburg. And again, you see he's, he's written Playhouse on top there. Uh, he was very, very detailed. He would do ping pong tables. He would even show you paddles and ping pong balls on the tables. Um, but he just loved to have fun doing it. Goldberg's and like Sheldrake. He had a special deal. If you wanted to spend a little more money, he would do a watercolor. And this is the Hollywood Hotel, um, where he did this um, in a Livingston Manor. And you could get the watercolor to make a be beautiful piece in your lobby, and then the same thing would be placed on postcards. But these were the most decorative and beautiful, and again, the style of the hotels is really all the same. So one of the, one of the people who had an article in my book uh, Jerry Jacobs, sociologist at the University of Pennsylvania. His family had a hotel in Del Mar. And you want to talk about what it's like uh, to work hard in the hotels. Um, many of the owners said, we can't go on with this. My kids don't want to do it. When he got his PhD, his parents said, we're so happy. Now you can come back to work at the hotel. <laughs> 
said, Mom, Dad, this was not what this exactly why I got the PhD. I can't do this. Uh, and, and, and most of the owners could not. They, they couldn't keep on with it. Uh, and this was the Del Mar, um, a postcard that you totally obviously fabricate because you invent this young couple who would never be staying there. <laughs> so it wasn't just the hard work of, of running a hotel, but it was like creating a, a whole culture. Uh, and you had to build your shuls. You had to have your Yiddishkeit culture. Um, and because people were observant, even if they weren't really, really observant, uh, they, they would not drive on Shabbat. And so it was too far at some point to, to walk. If you were in Swan Lake, there was a shul. If you were in White Lake, there was a shul. But in between, there was nothing. So people built Bichor Cholim, which to my mind is like the most beautiful shul in the entire Katska Mountains. It's small, it's simple, and, and that's all there is to it. And the utter simplicity of the doors I think are testament to what it meant for these these farmers and these hotel owners and these colony owners to put together their own labor to do it. And that was how it often happened. Um, these were very small shuls. Um, this was uh, in South Fallsburg. Um, this is Livingston Manor. You know, these are our bigger, more professionally built ones. Um, some of them, and with some gorgeous, gorgeous windows. Uh, here's the interior of the Lach Sheldrake shul. Um, with a beautiful beaten copper uh, door. It's like a work of art. The Catskills Institute uh, helped to get this on the National Register of Historic Places. But smaller places too, like in Greenfield Park, this is the kind of place where the, the local owners would build themselves, or the congregation on Shea Glen Wild, um, built again by, by the people who were nearby. And here, here we have uh, in Mountaindale, um, a small shul, um, a little side building there, which is a storage place. And it's got that little decorative thing on top. Everybody was putting those on, even for like a storehouse. And what, what was it based on? Not California mission architecture, but wooden shuls in Poland. This is the Kutno shul in Poland. And that was what they based the architecture on. And if you want to see a, another version of it, you know, you go to 72nd Street and Broadway, and you look at the IRT station, and, and, and that's, that's what it looks like, right? You, you would think this is a shul or a Catskills hotel. <laughs> if I do another book, it might be called The Catskills on Five. I'll make that six meals a day. <laughs> People love to eat, uh, sometimes in very elegant dining rooms like the Windsor. Um, mammoth meals, um, what one of hotel owner's sons said was a celebration of abundance. And it started from the very domestic production of, of the farmhouse. And this is what Murray Posner, one of the Brickman's owners, said. You didn't come to a hotel. You didn't come to a resort. You came to our house. You came to our family. And we treated you as part of the family. It didn't matter if you want another potato. We were growing them here. We grew the corn. We made the cheese. We made our own butter. And the cows were giving us milk twice a day. We can make all the butter and sour cream and milk and sweet cream and everything you needed. So we served with a full hand because that's what people came for. The dining room could be a little bit less fancy like in the jockey club, um, but whatever it was, wherever it was, the menus were a celebration of abundance. Uh, and if you look at this or some of the other menus on display, you will see many choices. It wasn't as if you would take two or three of these. You would, each of these was a course, right? You came, here's the juice, okay? okay? And then there's the appetizer. Only place in the world you would have baked herring. Uh, then you would have a cereal, then you would have the eggs, and then you would have some pastry. Uh, and then, of course, afterwards, you had eaten so much, you would go to down the road. Uh, and then for lunch, you came back, and again, a, a very elegant menu. And I'm telling you now, here's the activities of the day and the evening. Um, you eat a lot. Uh, again, the same thing, let's walk it off. And then you come back at night, uh, and, and there it is again. During the day, you go to the concession, because you're at the poolside. At night, after the show, you go, again, this is the Windsor, to the coffee shop. And maybe if there's also a late show, you come back again after the late show. And then if you're really adventurous, you drive into town, and you go to Kaplan's, or you go to Singer's, or Herbie's and Lake Sheldrake, Trafe, roast pork on garlic bread. <laughs> so 
So who is doing this? Um, nice young waiters like me. And the truth is, you know, there's a couple of photos out there of staff, but there weren't a lot of staff photos. Guests took photos of each other, but the staff didn't run around taking photos of each other. And hotels rarely assembled the staff to do it. But, but this was one case where the, the Kutcher's dining room staff of 1956, in fact, did take a group photograph. Uh, uh, <laughs> another interesting thing, of course, was and make sure that when you go to the beach, you do not dress like this guy. This, this is not an outfit you want to be seen in. But the important thing is that, that the, the bellhop here, who is literally twice his height at Kutcher's, is, as you all know, Will Chamberlain. And the hotels decided, among other things, and partly Milton Kutcher was a real sports fan and ran eventually a sports camp as well, had Red Auerbach as his director, the, the famous uh, Celtics coach. And uh, this was a really uh, powerful part of the mountains. They ran a league, and they would bring up the uh, college basketball players. And they would work in the hotels during the day. And then at night, they would put on the Kutcher shirt, and they would play in inter-hotel league games. And this was a big deal. Sadly, um, I went to Long Island University, which was implicated in this fixing scandal. Uh, the fixers who did that also at City and LIU also fixed the Catskills. Game, so that was sad. I'm not saying that, that Wilt was on the take, but some people were. Um, entertainment, the quality of entertainment up there was amazing. You know, and, and forget the great comics that you know. Um, because I'm a klezmer musician, I, I'm really very tempted to show you this. The Hotel Great is a very small place in Kayamisha. Um, for Pesach, here's their, their very um, modest thing. But look where the arrow is. Music by Dave Taras and orchestra. I mean, Taras was one of the two great klezmer band leaders who made klezmer a thing in the U.S. And here he was playing at a fairly low, uh, low-end hotel. The greatest was not really fancy by any means. Uh, of course, the Latin craze hit, and here we have uh, Emilio Reyes and his band. Um, Latin nights were very important. Uh, and the, uh, the dance routines that you see, um, you'll, you'll see in... Uh, uh, and some of the films will, will remind you of this. There was Champagne Night where the, the team would also not just do a couple of demo dances, but then would have people dance with them, and the audience would applaud, and the winner would get a bottle of champagne. So this was uh, another big part of it, the Latin. And some big, some big hotels had uh, a second band that was entirely a Latin band. And then, uh, in some cases, um, they would do recordings. Here's La Plata Sextet, Sextet playing at the Raleigh. And entertainment could be very modest. It could be a casino like this where you simply set up wooden chairs on a wooden floor and you had a stage that had uh, one curtain and that was about it. Um, the lake house um, was a, a very, very small place here um, in, um, uh, not in Woodbury, Mountaindale. Um, it later became an orthodox place. Very small, modest playhouses. Sometimes with, you know, even on the postcard, and again, that mission architecture on the playhouse. Um, but later, the big hotels, when they got um, uh, enough money, they would have very, very nice, fancy nightclubish type places. The Olympic, one of the larger places in Fallsburg, was like that. And this is what a real nightclub you know, um, would look like, um, in this case, um, at the uh, Evans Lock Sheldrake. Now, to run a hotel, to put all the stuff together, to keep the waiters and busboys and bellhops and chambermaids on their toes, to satisfy the guests, to deal with the entertainers and the booking agent and everything else, was a lot of work. And Elaine can tell you how much work this was. Um, Eileen can tell you how much work this was. It was a nonstop job. The hotel owners had to come up with a lot of devices to satisfy their guests. Now, the classic tumblers, they were poised to do this. That was what their great thing was. And they would engage in wild antics. Danny Kay was famous for chasing a fellow entertainer through the dining room with the meat cleaver. <laughs> and sometimes when the kitchen was running late, which happened a lot, and they, you couldn't keep the doors closed because, that, well, the guests are outside. When, when are they going to open up? When are they going to open up? <laughs> and so they would bring people in. But if they could get bogged down, and if they got bogged down in the middle of the meal, what would happen? So one family member tells me this. At the Granite, the orchestra played in the dining room. This was fancy. A march shepherded the guests and when the door opened and the background music entertained them through the meal. It was usually on Sundays 
when the orchestra was called upon and the kitchen fell behind. The orchestra would play the Star Spangled Banner, usually between the soup and the main dish. And the guests would stand in respect. As soon as they sat down, the band would play Hatikva, and everybody would get up again. This would give the kitchen maybe five or 10 minutes to catch up. And of course, over many years, the guests became wise, and they realized what was happening when the orchestra played the Star Spangled Banner. Uh, other stories, my friend uh, Dorothy Eagle from the Pine View in Lock Sheldrake tells me the story. Uh, some customer comes, and there's no more rooms left with a private bath. So she says, look, sit down, bring the busboy over, he'll give us some schnapps, I'll give you a good deal. And you know what? You want a private bath? You close the door, it's private. <laughs> So this was the kind of good humor that you had to have, and, and people put up with it um, because they knew that it was a place they wanted to be. And of course, most, most of you know it's gone, right? What's left uh, is Orthodox Enclave, um, the street scenes uh, in Woodburn and in South Fallsburg, um, they're all full of Orthodox places. Uh, Fialkov's uh, big bungalow colony in Monticello. Mostly, you don't know what the places are, okay? Sometimes, and I love this because the Kolel Tartikov bungalows tells you it was formerly Pine Hill Cottages. They have a sense of history, at least, which was wonderful, but usually they don't. Now, should you get lost wandering around and you need a mikvah, there, there is a sign. But places have been recycled, so the Laurel Park Hotel, becomes uh, the Yeshiva Gedola Zichron Moshe. Klein's hillside becomes Camp Gan Yisrael. And that was, Klein's was a very big place. The Fieldstone, my father had a, a coffee shop there once, became Camp Enos Yaakov. And the Cherry Hill, where I was first a full-time busboy at the tender age of 13, against all the state labor laws, of course, but my mother was the chef there, so we all kept a blind eye to this. They also had a slot machine in the coffee shop. <laughs> Lots of blind eyes. This became uh, also, and this was me at the age of 13, um, it became, uh, there's a sign. Uh, this is interesting, because here's a sign in the road on Route 52 to tell you what road to turn off. The egalitarianness of the, of the big signs um, the Tamarack, which is a huge, fancy place, has as much space as the Cherry Hill, a very small, modest place. And, you know, it's become, uh, like uh, a lot of other places, a yeshiva or a shraga. Um, a lot of places became very different. They became uh, rehab centers. So uh, the Murray Hill um, becomes dynamite. Uh, Green Acres becomes uh, New Hope. Uh, these, these places... Um, are, are what you see left. But I want to talk about the magic. Uh, I, I mentioned before these beautiful uh, Landis cards. Take a look at a close up here, the Pine Tree Villa. Uh, a walkway, what I call the promenade of the Jews, a place where you could sort of walk up past those beautiful posts, the gate posts, and up the stairs and into this hotel, which didn't have to be very grand, but for you it was grand because this was where you could afford to take your family. This was where you wanted to be. This was where you could have a card game at night. This was where you could play handball with the guys during the day. This was where your kids could finally you know, become uh, a junior counselor and later a counselor, and then um, you know, they could be a, a waitress or a waiter, and they could you know, go on and make money for college. This was uh, walking up that walkway, you approached a place where the hotel smiled at you. And when you look at them, they are smiling. Again, back to my parents' hotel. Um, it is, it's a human face. It's the face of the people who lived in it and, and their, uh, their place of nourishment, of schmoozing, of, of endless food. And when I say smiling, I, I mean it you know, quite literally. Again, people have recycled their private homes all over the place where people are living in. They often don't remember what was there. You see remnants of the old days. There's uh, places everywhere on, on every corner if you look. Um, sometimes, sometimes abandoned, sometimes not. Um, sometimes, um, in this case, they even tell you this was the Lakeview house, but the people who lived there didn't even know anything about its own history, even though the sign was on it. 
Um, and here's a place where I would show up with my cameras, a, a movie camera, a still camera, a slide camera back in the old days, and I would get chased off. They thought I was a tax collector. <laughs> Uh, but, but beautiful little homes that, that people are still running. The Hotel Israel in uh, Woodridge, uh, somebody had bought this, and they were converting this um, relatively decent-sized hotel that probably had like 60 rooms uh, into just a big private house. Um, and some of them actually got recycled later. They came back to be boarding homes. You can see the root cellars where they used to store stuff uh, in the side of a hill. Um, this was a place in, um, I think, in Livingston Manor that was uh, now a Korean place, Menji's. I think that was Menji's. This, this, this was the one. Uh, and th this is a, a, another uh, shot of, of a place that still um, is, is there. Mainly what you see are the abandoned pools. This became one of the emblems uh, with bushes growing in them. Or it became uh, the bungalow, uh, the uh, handball court. With, um, the name of the, the colony, you know, if that was the place where the, the hotel or the colony would write their name, sometimes just a single court, sometimes at the givers, three courts. Um, and this became uh, Yeshiva Viznitz. Uh, and this was the Greenwood Inn uh, in, uh, in Greenfield Park on, uh, on Briggs Highway. Um, and you see the bungo colonies smiling at you in their, in their circles. Um, you see the abandoned hotels. Here's a couple of them in Greenfield Park which actually had its own unique style. If you started to look architecturally, you could find that. Um, a little place right in the middle of Hurleyville that was just sort of still standing there, unoccupied. Uh, a place up on top of, of the road on the way to Cutcher's. And revival. This was an amazing thing. I drove, um, for, for many years, the Grand Mountain Hotel was famous for its late show with strippers. They would have people come all, from all over the mountains to see the strippers at the Grand Mountain. Uh, and this was a, a late 50s, early 60s glossy postcard of it. Um, later on, as I drove past it, um, this was what I saw, abandoned. Um, and, and one year I come by and there are people working on it. And it turns out what they're doing is they're rebuilding it. And after one season, they've got a whole new pool in. That's the same pool, just refinished. And they've got the ping pong table is there, guests are there. And, and that's what you see. So there are a few places where this has happened. Um, mainly what you see are chairs, empty chairs in empty hotels. And this is what you would see um, in this case at the Aladdin Hotel, the place where Carrie Comito at the age of, of 94 was still moving beds around so a family could have a cot for their child. I'm not going to go into the reasons why it declined. I think lots of you know that. But what I want to say is that I've been privileged in, in this um, in this life, because now I can tell the story. And as I write, then I collect, and I organize. I come back to Rome Country Roads in search of abandoned hotels to record on film for people, many of whom will never quite understand how a half a million people came every year to relax in hotels and bungalows, or how their doctors and professors came to work their way through the first generation of college. My camera record, records dibbocks grazing in the fallen timbers of old kitchens, hotel spirits lurking in the half-moon facades of Catskill Mission architecture. My tape recorder picks up from overgrown weeds the murmurs of requests for pickled locks, embraces in the staff quarters, cha-chas from champagne night in the casino. My heart logs a million desires, hopes, and dramas of every sort of East Coast Jew looking for something to make a life with. Miracles. The Catskills is full of miracles. Turning little boarding houses into hotels and bungalow colonies is a miracle. Making a place for the Jewish working class to get some fresh air is a miracle. Building a summer Eden that stretched for two counties worth of eternity is a miracle. And think of the pleasure experienced by any one of New York's millions who first stepped onto the grounds of the Kukulain bungalow colony or hotel and saw the cannons in the garden, smelled the fresh mown grass, heard the gurgle of the stream, smelled the brisket in the oven and the rugel on the table. Think of the pride of hotel ownership among hotel and bungalow colony proprietors who tended their family-style summer havens. Think of the waiters, busboys, counselors, and musicians who were so pleased to support themselves through college 
and the fun they had while doing it. It's a world mostly lost to us physically, but thanks to the wonderful work of Terry Burns and all of her helpers, is something visible in a very palpable way here today. And I hope that my words and this exhibit and this month of activities will return you to the places and times of what happened. So welcome back to Mountains. <laughs>